hello, I am back. Oh, thank you for the quick break. I know it's hard to know ahead of time how long all these things will take to talk about. Uh, I see everyone has their video turned off, so I'm just going to give a couple minutes. If you are there, feel free to just kind of give some indication that you're alive. So I'm not talking to myself and everyone's still off on break. Um, before we dive in, um, any lingering questions from the previous sessions? I know you might have specific questions too from your specific school, but we're happy to get into kind of any questions as we go along. And then there will be kind of a meet the team, but also just kind of general question and answer at the end of the day. Okay, cool. I see a little bit of activity, so that's enough for me. It is still recording too, so anyone who misses out on anything can catch up on the recordings. I'm gonna hop back into screen sharing and dive into the lovely world of reports. So I can no longer see the chat, which is always not fun when you're screen sharing, but um, be sure to give a little indication if you, I don't know, do your hands up if you desperately have something and I'll try and look at the chat. Aside from that, I am screen sharing and showing you the reporting system. So reporting is something that previously was done with an external module and it's definitely something that almost every school will need to do at some point in time because they want to take all of the data and evidence of school learning and marks and stuff and turn it into some kind of report pdf that can be shared with parents and with external organizations transcripts that kind of thing so in an, in the past couple of versions oh uh, i'll admit brian in the past couple of versions um, we have introduced the reporting system into the core. And since I'm the one who developed it, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of how the reporting system works. You will see that there are a lot of different options on the sidebar here. So I'm gonna start with the top and kind of get into the general nomenclature and structure of the reporting system. So within Gibbon, um, we have designated that reporting cycles are something that you can set up. And these are distinct from school year terms and there's, um, a reason for this is that it gives you flexibility depending on how your school reports and how often they report. So a school with four terms might report twice per year or a school with one term might report four times per year. So depending on your school, you might have different times per year. So a reporting cycle just delineates. Oh, welcome back, Brian. I might mute you as we get started, but be sure to give a shout if you have any questions. Um, so a reporting cycle delineates that period of time of that you are collecting data and it should begin with the very beginning of the period of time it shouldn't just only be the time in which teachers are writing the reports but it should begin at the very beginning of the period of time that you're looking to capture data so that other things let's say attendance data that might fall within that reporting cycle can be collected and displayed so i'm going to create a training reporting cycle as we get going and then we're going to work on configuring this reporting cycle and taking it through a little bit of its life cycle of how it um, works in the system so to begin with i'm going to give it a name and a short name and i'm going to determine what the reporting cycle start date and end date is and i'll keep it nice and clean and start on january 1st and maybe say i will end at the end of the current month. So this is my reporting cycle. And again, it doesn't have to match up specifically with your school year terms because it might not depending on your school year. I'm also gonna configure what cycle number this is out of a total number of cycles. So if a school did report four times, it's important for the system to be able to know that you report four times because there might be areas where it displays different columns or different selections depending on what cycle you're in. So this is the first cycle of an expected four which is unfortunate for the teachers writing those reports um and then i can select which year groups are related to this report i'm just going to do year seven because it's the first one and it's nice and easy but you can have a, a report that um, covers multiple year groups as well notes or anything that you can record here and depending on your templates they can optionally be added to the report itself milestones are not displayed on the report itself but they're set up here as a way for staff to know what this reporting cycle entails. And a lot of times you will have to communicate different dates and different deadlines to staff as they go through a reporting cycle. So it's a good um, way to set up some milestones here. So I might add a, a couple quick milestones for myself just to let me know, me and my theoretical staff know, maybe I'll make my grades do a week later and then 
let people know what kind of dates they're dealing with. So my reporting cycle goes to the end of month, I might do my final printing a couple days ahead of time. And these are just generic text entry, you can customize them as you need. And I'm going to submit and I've now created a new reporting cycle, which I can find under manage reporting cycles. You can actually drag and drop them around too, because if you have multiple reporting cycles, you might want to indicate which ones become come before other ones. So I've now created a reporting cycle. This determines that I am going to run a process of reporting for my staff. What I'm reporting on is a very good question. So now that I've created the reporting cycle, scopes and criteria will define what I will be reporting on. And every school report card reporting system is different. So you will find that it's a very flexible system. But like many areas of Gibbon, because it's flexible, it can be a little confusing to begin with. So a scope, I'm going to add one here, um, determines what area of the system and who will be reporting on what. So a year group scope means you're reporting on all the students in a specific year group. A role group scope is all the students within a specific role group. And then you can do, do course by course scope, which means course teachers are the ones who are writing and entering information. Uh, for the year group, you might have leaderships or head of years entering information. And for role group, the people who enter the information are um, those up to three different um, role group tutors that are selected for those role groups. So in this case, I might set up a role group. And this is, and then I'm going to give this scope a name. So my school um, might simply have something called pastoral uh, reports that are added to um, each of my reports. You're given a lot of options for customizing here, but if all else fails, just call it a role groups uh, scope. I'm gonna set that up and I'm gonna use the breadcrumbs a lot. You'll find that because it's a very large module and it's complex, I'm gonna use the breadcrumbs a lot to move between um, the different areas. And that just allows me to hop back a few levels when I'm on a screen to get back to the previous screen that I'm on. So we can see I've created a pastoral report scope that scope, no one can access it yet, and there's nothing inside it. So the next step is to click the pencil and we can start adding criteria. And this is where the terminology can become a little overwhelming at first, but once you get into it, it's a very flexible system. Criteria specifically defines what is being written and reported on for those students. So some schools might specifically enter grades for their students. Some schools might want to enter comments. Some schools might have an effort um, comment, other types of um, indications for students. So what we're defining for this reporting cycle is what data is being entered for each student. And in this case, for that role group, because I've selected role group as my course. If I was entering data for courses, I could select them for courses as well. I'm gonna add some criteria here. Oh, actually, before I do that, I'm gonna also show you that there's criteria types, which gets a little bit more complex, but, uh, oh, and we can see because it's my demo system, I have a lot of different criteria types. The default ones are, are comments and um, basic text entry, but because once your school gets um, somewhat complex, you can also enter custom criteria types. And when we're thinking of what type of data um, that we're reporting on, the criteria is the actual data that teachers will be entering. The criteria type is the general type of data that is available uh, for us to set up criteria with. The reason these are defined is because the template often needs to know the criteria type in order to properly display that data. It needs to know this is a comment versus this is a text entry or this is a number because the template often needs to know how to display that information. I'm not going to add any new criteria types because it actually looks like from my list I've got a very good variety of them going on here. Actually, I might add one quickly because one of the most important ones that you'll often add is grade scales. So if your school has a custom grade scale, you'll often need to create a criteria for that grade scale. So I'm going to grab a grade scale here and enable my system to have reporting criteria for percent grades. I'm gonna add that here and we can now, if I go to manage criteria, we can see that percent grades are something that I can report on. It doesn't mean I'm automatically reporting on it because these criteria are set up for the entire system, but it means it's now available for me to report on. So I'm gonna just show you here so you don't get entirely lost. We started in manage reporting cycles. We created the reporting cycle called training 
once we set up the initial information and milestones, the, the most important section you'll see here is the managed sc scopes and criteria. That is what is being reported on. We created a scope called pastoral reports, and I'm gonna come in here and start adding some criteria. So when I click add multiple, which is the, the best one to start with, um, I can see a selection of the role groups available and then you, you can only see role groups because that's the scope that I'm currently working in. Um, and then I can start adding criteria. So I'm going to say, since this is a year seven report, I'm gonna select my year seven role groups and I'm gonna say that I want a pastoral comment written about each one of these students. Um, the description is just something that shows up to the teachers if they need any additional prompting as they're writing that comment. Categories are optional. I'm gonna leave this one blank, but if you did have a very large complex, oh, and I just noticed um, Kevin's hand is, or Kelvin's hand is up. Um, if you have a very large and complex report, you can subdivide those criteria just visually on the screen for teachers to see that they're in different categories. Just gonna finish this one section and then Kelvin, I'll get to your question. Um, I'm going to select a criteria type. I'm not gonna do percent because I just um, decided to call this one a comment. So I'm gonna select um, one of my available comments. The reason I have three different comment criteria set up here is because we, we can define the maximum length for different comments and use them in different areas of the system. You might want a longer comment available for your pastoral comments and perhaps a shorter one available for diff different courses or classes within your system. The final thing to understand is the target, and there's a lot of terminology going on here, but the target is basically, are we writing this piece of criteria for every single student in the form group, or are we writing one comment for the entire form group? So it is possible if you had a teacher where they wanted to write a note or a comment about an entire, sorry, role group, form group, home group, those are um, common uh, names for the same thing, you wanted a single comment for an entire role group, you would select per group. But if you'd want one, in this case, a pastoral comment per student, and it'll be a long comment. So I'm gonna add this criteria to my report and we can see it was added. It takes us back to a blank page so that we can continue adding criteria. So I'm just gonna hop up one level and we can see that that criteria was added to the four things that I selected. Kelvin, you have a question? Yes. How are you? First. Thank you for this uh, webinar. And uh, my question is, how can we uh, use the yes or no uh, criteria? There's a yes or no uh, option. And can you try and uh, come up with a sample of it? Yes. Um, so I'll go manage criteria types and I'm going to create a new yes or no criteria. So um, one of the examples that we have used for a school in the past is teachers, when they're writing the reports, will indicate whether they would like to schedule an interview with the parents. So on the report card, there might be an indication saying, yes, the teacher would like to have an interview. So later when there is some sort of teacher conferencing set up, then it can be indicated on the report card that the teacher said, yes, I'm interested in talking with the parent. And then the parents will know that they should get in touch and schedule a uh, parent-teacher conference with that teacher. So I'm gonna add, um, this is a, actually, I'm just going to call it interview um, because this is just a general criteria type that I'm adding to the system and I'm going to add it available as a yes, no. So this, um, if I was building custom templates for my school, that template would now know when it sees a yes, no value with an interview tag on it, it can choose how to display that. So it might have a little text box that pops up that says, this teacher has requested an interview, please get in touch. And we'll look at templates a little bit later as time allows, but definitely know that it's a very flexible system that that allows. So this is an example of a yes, no, and I'm gonna add that here. And that's the criteria type. So I'm gonna just pop back into the specific scope that I was working on so we don't get lost. We can see the criteria I just added here. I can click add multiple again, but there's also a nice little um, system here where I can just double check and add to the specific courses down the um, side here. So I can select the, the, sorry, in this case, role groups and add that criteria to those role groups. So it's gonna select them here. And then I will say, and this is something that will show up on the teacher screen where they can then indicate um, an interview criteria that is available per student. 
And if we needed additional information to display to the teachers of how that works, we can give them a description as well. So I'm gonna add that criteria. So we can start to see that our um, criteria is starting to develop. There's different types of criteria being added to our report card. You'll see that it says status unlocked to begin with because no one has entered data for those criteria. As soon as teachers begin writing that report, those criteria will be locked because if you were to change or delete the criteria, you would actually be changing and deleting data that the teacher has entered into the system, which would theoretically be a very bad thing. So you will see they become locked at a certain point. So you wanna be sure that your system is fully configured and ready to go before you open up access to a teacher. And that'll actually lead me into the next section before we get into too further into the reports of how do we set up and how do we start looking at what does it look like to write the report? So we have some criteria, we have a comment and an interview um, yes, no box. I'm gonna now set up theoretical access for someone to begin working on these reports. So just because a reporting cycle exists doesn't mean that people can see it, log into it or access those specific reports. Before I dive into access, I do see if there are some hands up. So I'll start with Brian, you have a question? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Because I, my yeah. map was shot. Okay, good. Um, a quick one, uh, sometimes, and it has happened, I've added a comment box and, uh, or it was actually, uh, all right, and, and someone's entered it, then they decided, no, they didn't actually want the comment box. We've deleted the entry, but you, once it's locked, I could not delete that out of the system. Is there yeah. any easy way around that? There is. Um, it was initially a bug, but I dec decided to leave it in because it then became a feature. Um, under manage reporting cycles, if I were to go back into my scope and back into the list of criteria, you can see that there are some checkboxes down the side. If I were to select the checkbox and select delete, it's actually not going to check whether these criteria are locked or not. So it is just going to do a hard delete on that criteria. So know that that option is available. Um, it's going to, when you hit go prompt, do you really, really want to do this? And just know that it will be a destructive operation. It will delete those criteria, but it will, it will ignore the um, locks on that criteria. If you go in and view them individually, you'll see that the, the trash can definitely disappears as soon as that's locked. And we can take a look at yes. that in a second. But um, that is the one little workaround is you can use that bulk action delete if you desperately need to get rid of criteria. It will delete all the criteria for that specific class, unfortunately, though. Yeah. So that's, that's good to know. But it, it's definitely good to have things co configured ahead of time. I think one other option. Uh, no, I don't think you can even detach. Uh, one other thing of note, because it just popped up here. Because I used the add multiple option to create my criteria, I selected all four role, um, role groups and added my cr criteria at the same time. They're considered grouped together. So when I try and edit them, it's gonna let me know that these, I'm actually editing those four records that were added together, um, which makes it handy if I did need to change something like a name on it, that it's changing it for the four things that I added at the same time, which really does speed up life. Um, when you're configuring your reports. If you need to edit or detach something on its own or edit or delete something on its own, you can click to detach. It'll remove it from the group and it'll edit it as a single unit. That um, exists because criteria is often specifically added for groups of um, courses or groups of role groups at a time. So Brian, you still have your hand up. Would, this, would you say that kind of generally answers your question? Yes, awesome. it does, thank you. Thanks. Awesome. And Kelvin, do you have another question or is your hand still up from before? I'm waiting for the reports. I'm having, yeah, I'm having trouble. Um, there's a little bit of background noise. Are you able to type your question in the chat? I know Ross is taking a look in the chat too. I'm screen sharing, so I can't quite see it, but I bet he will hop on your question there. And in the sake of time, I might carry on into accessing a report. So now that we've set up what is being reported on for that particular reporting cycle, we might want people to actually start 
accessing the report and writing those reports. So in this section, I'm going to select that teachers are going to begin writing this training report. I have to select my scope because you might have different people writing different scopes at different times. And now I'm going to select a start date and an end date because I want to work on it today. I'm going to select a start date in the past and I'm going to select my end date for sometime next week. So just because the reporting cycle, if you remember, I created the reporting cycle began January 1st and ended the end of this month. The access for teachers to be able to come in and change this data is going to end next Friday and, and know that it's per date. So it'll actually end at like midnight of um, that Friday. Um, and then can write and can proofread are available because you might want people to be able to access and do one or the other, but not both. So you can choose which options. I'm going to leave them both on because I'm going to give you a quick overview of what that looks like. So I've now created access for teachers to um, begin writing those reports. As a note, this access isn't the same thing as user permissions in a system. The teacher does need permission um, to access the reporting module in general and to access the report writing um, features. By default, those are turned on for the teacher role, but if you have custom roles in your system, you will want to check before you open your reporting system that teachers not only have access here in the reporting system, but have system-wide access to the roles to write reports and proofread and stuff like that. So those are extra checks and balances. The reason this access exists as a separate feature is because it gives you that start and end date. We find in a reporting cycle, a lot of times there's a period in which you want teachers to begin rep writing reports and stop writing reports. And you often want them to stop writing reports long before you print or send those reports out to your community. So I've set the access that I now have access and I can come into the reporting screen. Now, I'm not currently detected as, as part of an active reporting cycle because I've set up a scope that was available to, I believe, role groups of year seven. So what I'm actually gonna do is cheat quickly and I'm gonna make myself not head of year, role groups for year seven. So this teacher will now be replaced by myself. So I am now a role group tutor for year seven. And because there is now an active reporting cycle for, I hit submit, year seven tutor, man, manage role groups. One second, active reporting cycle, access. March 1st and March 12th, pastoral teacher. Uh, I might also be looking at my role within the system and because I'm currently logged in as administrator, it was not picking up on that access. There we go. So you will notice that it, it is also looking at the role. So just because someone is a teacher, you might have multiple types of teacher roles. So be sure you can shift or um, control select to give multiple options in that list. And that was only because I am currently logged in as an administrator. I'm making that um, available to both administrators and teachers. So now that that access is available, we can see the My Reporting screen. This is actually the default screen. Anytime a teacher comes in to view the reports, this is the first screen they go to. Administrators can choose to view the My Reporting screen for any teacher. Um, so certainly um, we can see if there are reports active for other users. Generally, users wouldn't see this drop down. They would only see the My Reporting section for themselves. So now that I'm part of the training reporting cycle, we can see the full dates for that reporting cycle. These are the milestones that I entered, just highlighting different upcoming um, dates, and they will turn gray um, in the past as these milestones are met. This is just a visual aid. It doesn't limit or um, automate anything in the system, but it's definitely a good visual aid for teachers who are moving through this report writing system. Um, because this is the first time I visited the page, you can see that none of my progress has begun, but I have access to the scope that we set up. So the name you're seeing here, Pastoral Reports, relates specifically to that scope that I created. And you can see it says you have access from March 1st to March 12th. So my access dates aren't exactly the same as the reporting dates because those are set up specifically for my role within the system, and they will end automatically when my access is over. So because I'm now a form tutor for year 7.1, I can come in here and begin writing my reports. Um, 
This is a list of the students that are in the form group. This is the demo data, so you can see a lot of my students. But because it's um, my development system, you'll also see some of my MIC tests have been enrolled into year seven. Um, the student at the top tends to get picked on a lot because their name shows up first in every single list. Um, and this is what it what looks like to begin writing reports. And this is specifically what teachers will see. They have it divided into a to-do list. So the very first time they come in, it'll um, tell them all the students that are available to begin writing. If they were to start writing a report but not complete it, it would be shown in progress. And then when they are done, it'll show up as complete. If there were past reports for this year group, you can also click and see them because it's a demo system. You can see there are also some other year seven reports going on, but training is definitely the one that I set up here <clears throat> and created today. Um, so I'm gonna hop into what it looks like to write a report for this student. Um, the important views at the top here is just telling me again, the name of the scope that I'm currently in, the name of the report that I'm on. It gives me a great quick glance at the student that I'm writing with a lot of links to additional information. If I need to consult additional information for that student, any of the alerts that might've been created for that student and allows me to begin and come into the report writing process. These criteria that you see here specifically match the criteria that we set up previously in our um, manage reporting cycle system. So I decided that a comment was gonna be written for this student, that it was gonna be a long comment. So it has 1,250 um, characters and it allows me to begin typing. There are some neat um, kind of checks and balances here. So a lot of times we will find that you will want to um, talk about the student in your report. So if the student name does not show up in that report, it will let you know. It also has a quick check to double check the pronouns. If you use a he or she in your report and it doesn't match the gender of that student, it will simply let you know that the pronouns might be wrong. And that can often happen if teachers are copying and pasting from other reports, or if they simply thought they were on the wrong student and started writing the wrong comment. And this is a yes, no checkbox um, that we set up. So we can see if I would like to request an interview. So perhaps, Reese um, needs to talk to me, uh, could be my pastoral comment. Hopefully um, they are doing well, but because they're my test student in the system, they do tend to get a lot of behavioral uh, and other data entered for them. So unfortunately they need to talk to their teacher. That's the comment. I'm gonna request an interview. And then I'm gonna mark this report as complete. And this is a very important step because it tells the system that the teacher has finished. Just because they entered data doesn't mean they've definitively finished writing those reports. So the teacher specifically says, yes, this is complete. As soon as they check complete, it offers them to save and go into the next student. And that's just for convenience so, student, so teachers can go through an entire list. We can see the list down the side here. So we can see that for this particular theoretical teacher, they have 35 different comments they're gonna be writing. They're gonna to wanna to be able to move through this list and see their progress as they go. So I'm gonna hit save and next. And we can see that this marked Abbott Reese off as um, complete. We can click on that student in the list to go back and make changes. And those changes can be made up until my access is revoked. So teachers can definitely continue refining the reports, but telling it complete just starts marking off the progress in this system. You can also mark it complete if there's no data, because sometimes you will know definitively that this report is complete for this student. Perhaps they weren't a part of your role group, they just started or they just left and you know that you're not reporting on this particular student. So I'm gonna just mark a couple other students as complete for the sake of example. And we can see my progress bar is filling up here. I can click the name here to get back to the full list that we started with. And you'll see that my students have started to move from the to-do list into the complete list. If I had a student that I was writing information about, but I hadn't checked complete, we will see them show up in that in progress stage. So it really helps prompt teachers to begin entering their data and to know when they are, they've completed entering their data. This completion is important because it also gives administrators in the system additional information about how the progress is um, coming along for that particular reporting cycle. So this is the teacher view generally, but because I'm also administrator, I'm gonna pop into the progress view to show you how progress is coming along for that student or for that reporting cycle. So we can see, I'm clicking progress by person and we can see some of that progress. Am I in the right report? I'm gonna 
get into the specific reporting cycle that I just uh, set up. And we can see that uh, progress is coming along nicely. So um, these are the teachers. So this is by person. We can see myself and I wrote four student reports. And if someone wanted to view what those reports are, they could click and view and come in. This is generally available only to administrators, but it's a great way to see if people have completed, especially if you have certain milestones that you're reaching, they've completed things by certain times. You can also see the progress, progress by the reporting cycle itself. So because there are four form groups or four role groups in this particular reporting cycle, we can see there's um, 97 total students and I have completed four of them. So this progress will slowly fill up. And if you have multiple reporting cycles on the go, this is a good way to manage them and see how they are progressing. Um, any questions at this stage before I soldier on because there's so much going on with reports that uh, I will probably use up the entire hour. Any questions? Brian, I see you have your hand up. Sorry, uh, quick one. You know what happens, of course, is teachers after the been after the cutoff date are going to come up and say, "Oh, I've got to modify a individual report now." Uh, I don't want to give all teachers access, um, is the only way to get them to do it with an administrator or someone that still continue with access? Yes, so there are, and under user permissions, you can give certain roles in the system the ability to access reports regardless of the access here. Um, I won't get into that, well, I might very quickly because it is useful to know. So if I were to come in to manage permissions, I can find the reporting module or reports. And I can see all the permissions available. And under writing reports, there is one called write reports edit all. So we can see administrators can edit all reports regardless of access, regardless of the time and date or year that they were written on. You generally wouldn't change a report after the fact, but you do occasionally have those um, instances that come up. Um, you're correct in that you wouldn't want to open up access for the entire report for that um, for those teachers. Um, at this point, there isn't a way to give access to an individual person at an individual time. So it is recommended to have someone that they would go to to request changes to be made on their behalf. So whether that's an administrator or another role that is delegated, like a leadership or a head of year role, you can give those people access to come in to write reports. And because they wouldn't see it um, on their own report writing screen, because this is only things that relate to me, they can come in to write reports here and they can select down into the reporting cycle and specifically edit for other people. If someone didn't have the edit all access and they came into one of these screens, they would see it as a read only view. Um, but, and especially if the, as soon as the access date ends, the teacher can still come in and see the reporting data that has entered, been entered, but they cannot make changes to it. So yes, it's good if your access has ended and you don't want to give access and you don't want to open access up again, you definitely need to go through a leadership or other person. And it's a good way to get the teachers to really know, um, do they desperately want to make changes to these things? And it's a good way to kind of curb those things so that hopefully they know to get it in ahead of time. Otherwise they have to request access to make those changes. Yeah, giving to the leadership is probably the best the thing. As to whether the reporting module can be used for like trip reports or seminars, so different groupings within the school. Um, I've said you could sort of fake a class to do that, um, but also the, the discussion system that you're working on might be a good way to do that. Yeah. yeah so I don't know yeah. if you want to maybe just touch on the discussion bit at the end as a sort of alternative assessment tool. Yes, yeah. that might still be in development. Yeah, but just sort okay. of a, a, a heads up. I don't know if you can 100% pick up on what Ross is saying on my microphone. I might not repeat it back, but I will definitely touch on that at the end if we don't run out of time. Um, so you can see, um, carrying on here, you can see that I've completed some of the reports. One of them is in progress, marked by a pencil. Um, I'm not gonna do too much more on what the report writing screen looks like here. But we also can know because this is a because I'm considered the form tutor uh, for this group or sorry the rule group tutor for this group, I can also see other reports that have been written about this student. So if there were subject comments or course comments and notes being put in for the student, I can also preview and see those. 
Um, there's also controls for moving between um, one student to the next, just help you move through an entire list. Report writing can often be a tedious process for teachers, but it is definitely, we try to make it as painless as possible um, for a process that is often not fun. Um, this moves us into proofreading. Often once the reporting writing section is done, you will um, get people who proofread, either teachers proofreading for each other or leadership proofreading for um, different users. So I can't quite see uh, what proofreading looks like because I don't have a different user. Let me grab a different user. One of my fake teachers, we will pick Jacqueline is going to have written a comment about their student. And because I have a high level access in the system, I can write it for them, perhaps if they were sick or unavailable. I, because I have a high level access, I can write that for them. But generally, it would be the teacher themselves entering that data. So I just moved a little quickly. But what I did is I hopped back into the report writing um, system and entered data for that first student for that teacher. And now I'm going to pretend to proofread for that teacher. So I'm gonna come into the proofreading system, select the person that I wanna proofread for. And I believe her last name started with an R and select Jacqueline. So Jacqueline has written one comment so far. We can see this is the comment they've written about their student. If they've written a lot of different comments, we can glance here through the list. If I just checking off and saying, yes, I've proofread it and it looks good, I'm just gonna hit looks good and carry on. But if I did want to help make amendments to this comment, let's say something is missing, um, I can let the teacher know that something is missing. And I can let them know why I made changes to the comment. So maybe there was a typo in their comment. So I can make those edits and I'm going to suggest them back to the teacher. It's not going to automatically make the changes, but it's going to suggest those back to the teacher. So I'm going to hit save here. And that's now done. It's automatically collapsed because I've finished proofreading it. And if I was proofreading a lot of different things, I would want to be able to move through the system and proofread it. Now, because I have high level access in the system, I'm going to click override and see what Jacqueline's view of that proofreading would look like. And that would allows me to then theoretically view and accept those changes on her behalf. But also this is what Jacqueline would see if um, she came into the system and had edits suggested for her. Um, and those also show up on the My Reporting screen. So once you've moved into the proofreading section of the report, those will show up under My Reporting as well. So teachers can know that they have pending edits that they need to address. Because again, I have not directly edited um, this comment for the teacher, but I've suggested a change. And similar to document editing format, we can see that the change that I've made is highlighted as a removal and an addition. So we can see this is what was edited. And I, as Jacqueline, would choose if I accept that um, edit, um, decline that edit, or continue editing that comment. And in this case, because um, I think it looks good, well, actually, I probably should edit that. I'm going to accept that edit and say that proofreading is done. So now, my proofreading process is kind of a back and forth, but it's kind of an automated process for someone else to go through proofread, suggest edits, and, and also for me to address those edits. So I've now addressed all of the edits that were suggested for me. Um, I'm gonna do another quick, any questions before we move on? Because the next thing I'm gonna move on to is what do the reports actually look like when we start generating and creating them? Any questions? Be sure to click the little button to raise your hand if you have a question or put it in the chat. Uh, yes, Kelvin. Hope you can hear me. I said my time zone is a bit cold here. So I hope you can hear my audio. Um, I could hear you there briefly. Yeah. Reaching a question about. Uh, how we get the overall input and uh, the thing about uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hearing individual words, but I'm also hearing some background noises making it hard for me. If you're able to pop that into chat. I think he has, so he said, oh. uh, Clement 
touch on each student mean grade under the report builder custom assets. Um, okay, so there isn't actually a built in process for generating uh, mean grades for students or other averages, partially because so many schools are so different. Some schools, the way they calculate averages and weightings are different. Um, so there isn't a way for that to be automated, but you can create a criteria where that data is entered. So if you did want to enter, let's say, a final grade for a student, I could come in to manage criteria. And I'm going to, or sorry, manage reporting cycles. And I'm going to select that reporting cycle that I set up. And I could theoretically add um, a criteria that is specifically targeted for a grade. And because I created a criteria type called percent grade earlier, I can add a criteria for teachers to enter a grade for students. So now that that criteria is there, if I were to go back and view. <clears throat> We can see that these two are now locked because I was making changes and the teachers had already started writing. This one is unlocked because it's brand new. But if I'm a teacher and I come back here into my manage reporting screen and I grab my student, I can now see that it's requesting that I select a grade as well. So there isn't an automated way of turning mark books into reporting data because there's so many different ways that that can be calculated. But there is definitely a way for once a mean grade has been achieved. And I can definitely consult my markbook data so I could pull up and see if there was any markbook data available for the student. I could see what that markbook um, data available is and then arrive on a specific number for that student. Then I can save that number so that it's available for the reports. Did that help answer your question? If not, be sure to pop it into chat. I know we're running, we probably have about 15 minutes left until this particular session is done. So I might keep carrying on, but be sure to pop things into chat if you have any questions. Nice. And before my voice gives out completely because I don't normally talk this much in one single sitting. So template builder, and that's the danger of being a programmer. You don't talk this much. Um, so um, template builder. So now that we have a reporting cycle, um, and, a, and a lot of times you'll find the reports modules divided into these two areas. One is the process of gathering data to put into the reports, and the other is the process of designing and generating the reports themselves. So I'm going to hop into the template builder. And the template builder is um, a little bit complex, and uh, I can't go into absolutely every piece of it um, in detail today because there are a lot of pieces of it, and it's designed to be very flexible. So there are a lot of controls in there for people to build and customize their own templates. I'm going to work with the assets and the um, defaults that are built in today. So I'm going to hit add and I'm going to create a new template specifically for training. And I'm going to attach it to a reporting cycle. If I wanted, I could attach it to student enrollment and that might be just something that is generated, let's say once per year, such as a transcript or something like that. But because I want it specifically pulling data from my reporting cycle, I'm going to say that this is a template designed for reporting cycles. I'm going to choose a few defaults here and just leave these as default for now. Um, and perhaps in some future training day, we'll get more in depth into how to actually develop specific reporting templates. I'm going to leave these as default as well. You can select the orientation of your paper, paper size and margins, because we're now starting to define what will it look like in a PDF and what will it look like on paper to create a report for the student. I'm going to scroll past this because I'm now editing the exact thing that I just created and get into the template builder itself. We've created a drag drop system here and almost every template is divided into three sections so you can have headers and footers for each page and then the body of your report. So I'm going to start dragging a few things here. There are built in templates as well as additional templates. So if you do customize and build your own templates, they will show up under additional. But for today, I'm going to show you the default templates that are built in. And these are some of the different sections. And they're a little bit like Lego pieces, where you take the available pieces, um, drag and drop and arrange them, customize them, configure them into your template in order to generate a template. Um, as you're hovering over these, you'll see a little tiny preview. So can, we can see, see what some of these sections look like before we drag them into our report. So actually, I like the look of that cover page. So I'm going to say that there's a cover page on my report. So I'm dragging that in first. Um, and I might want to look at this one, report name. Well, that was on my cover page. I don't really need that. 
but maybe I want some student info to show up after my cover page. So I'm going to add some student info. And because we were just writing role group scopes for my report, I want to add those role group comments and those role group grades to the report that I just uh, wrote. So I'm going to drag, this is the reporting cycle section. I'm going to drag a report, uh, role group report into that section here. Um, a few other things you can add. There's other data in the system that you can begin to pull in if the student was involved in activities, if they had attendance, you can also add those to your reports. And then you might want to customize the headers and footers. So I'm just going to add something simple here. I'm going to add a page number to the footer. I'm just going to hit refresh quickly. Um, and I might want to add just the name of the report and the name of the student to the top of the report. Now you will see as you're previewing some of this thing um, that there are names and there are weird dates showing up. Everything when you're seeing when you're building the template is all designed with fake data. And this is so that you can see and preview and build your template as if it was a real um, report. But obviously we don't want to expose any student data at this point, especially if you want to share those designs with other people, you can generate some previews, share those with other people and it is always fake data. Kelvin's asking the difference between the report role group and the comment role group blocks. That's a good question. So if I click on them, <clears throat> the comment role group block will only pull out comment criteria. So when we were setting up our criteria types, one of the types of criteria that we could set up was comments. So if you're if you wanted to display comments in a separate section than other information on your report, you might want to just pull out report comments. Whereas um, the report role group will show you all of the criteria for that particular role group. And similar for year groups and report year groups, comments just help you pull them out in a slightly different format and are available as a kind of a, a starting point if people wish to customize their reports at that point too. So I have a bit of a report coming up and dragging and dropping things into them. I wanna see what it looks like now. So I'm gonna click preview HTML that's going to show us the different pieces I've added so far. I have a sample report um, header here at the top because that's what I dragged into my header. I have that um, cover page and I have some of the other components that I've dragged in here. You'll see it's all very basic and generic looking. Um, and that's actually because I didn't select something that's called a style sheet up here because you can actually have different ways of displaying a report. So I'm actually going to select default style sheet and that will make my report look a little bit nicer. It will give it some some lines, some tables, some headings and blocks around it. But if you are starting from scratch and your school has a very specific way of things looking, you might wanna use a default style sheet or create your own style sheet. We can't get into that today, but it is definitely a very flexible system to be able to do that. Another thing I might wanna do is the cover page should probably show up only on the first page. And I want this one to start on the second page. So I'm gonna hop into here, student info, I'm going to define that there's a page break before we start this section in the report. There's other things you can configure in here. Be sure to check them out. There's a lot of different flags and settings, but those are some of the most useful ones. Another useful one is to be able to set um, which page headers and footers show up on. So I might want to add a signature to my report and I can see there's a couple options for signatures. And I want to add that signature only on the last page. So I'm going to select last page and hit go. And now when that report is generated, it will only put a signature on the last page. Now, it's important to note that the HTML preview is here for expedience. It's very quick to be able to view that HTML preview. We can see because I added a page break, this starts at the top here now, and we can see page one um, and the last page has a signature on it. The HTML preview is not 100% perfect because at the end of the day, everything will be rendered into a PDF. So it, it is good to preview as a PDF, the HTML preview is faster, but you will want to preview as a PDF. Now, I believe I'm probably only sharing. Yeah, uh, sorry, Ross just put his hand up. He has a question while I reshare my screen. Oh, five minutes. Okay, that is awesome. Try and get through it quickly without losing my voice. So I just generated a training preview PDF and it is gonna show me definitively what the PDF is gonna look like. So it's a little tiny bit different than the HTML preview, but this is a lot closer to what it'll look like. Again, this is all fake data, lots of lorem ipsum and stuff like that. 
but we can see some of the information that was added to this report. I'm going to very quickly continue moving on because we actually want to now generate real data with this report. So I've created a template um, and we have a real reporting cycle going on, a real fake one. Um, so now I want to create that report and attach this template to that report. And that's where I'm going to go into manage reports. You'll see some other fake data in there. I'm going to create this new report. And the in important distinction is a report is actually the document itself. The reporting cycle is the process of collecting information. So now that I'm creating the report, this will define what the document looks like. So I'm going to select my training template for my training report. That's my training reporting cycle that is specific to the year seven group. Um, we won't go too much into archives, but you can also define where in the system these reports are saved. So the PDFs are saved on your server and who can access them. The go live data is very important because you don't want any parents or other people in the system, should they have access, to be able to view that report before you're 100% ready for it to be viewed. So I'll set that like way in the future. Now that that report exists, I could theoretically begin generating that report. So we have data in the system. We have a template. We've created our report. We're ready to start generating. So I'm going to hop into the training report. We can see there's 98 students for this particular report. It's never been created before. Um, I can generate it for an entire year group at a time, and that'll create one big long document, or I can generate it for a single student at a time. And we can see this is a list of students. They are listed by role group first and then um, by student last name. Abbott Reese is the student that I tend to pick on the most. So I'm going to generate the report for them. And I'm going to select the checkbox down the side. because so this is a bulk action checkbox. I'm going to scroll up to the top here and select which report. You can uh, generate reports as draft. Those add a watermark to them. And they make sure that they never show up to the wrong users in the system. They're always just available for administrators or optionally teachers to view, or I can generate it as a final report. In this case, I'm going to keep it as a draft because I don't want um, it to be viewable in the system. So here's my theoretical draft report. I can click on that report to download and view it. And you will see that it looks much like the template before, but it is no longer populated with fake data. This is the training report is the name of the document that I gave it. Demo is the name of my system. This is the date that it was generated on. We can see the student name because I chose this particular header. And we can see second page. It's marked as a draft, just so everyone knows that this is not a real report. But these are the specific sections that I created. And while I was writing my report, me and I guess my co-teacher O'Doyle um, entered a pastoral comment that Reese needs to talk to us. We indicated that an interview was requested and we entered a percent grade. So these are the specific criteria that were written on and are now showing up on the report. I guess because Reese is my test student that I often pick on, they also have some attendance data in the system. And this is pulling in from the school year terms. And it has a signature at the bottom because it's a draft report. The signature is um, always filled in with drafts. So no one signs a report that they should not be signing. But you can also use um, digital signatures when you're setting up your template. This is a very high level overview of the reports. I wish we could go into further detail. And in theory, as we continue working on our documentation, there is a section in there about reports in the documentation, but we will continue working on fleshing that out as well. Um, one final look is there are some additional tools. Once you have generated those reports, there are some tools for sending those reports out to parents. So um the one that i generated just now wasn't a final report but once it's a final report you can email that report out to parents i will do that very quickly because it's kind of useful to know about so i will create a final report for that student it will overwrite the existing draft it is now a final report and i could theoretically uh, my go live date has not been met, so my system is not letting me send this report because it is, it is not a live report. If it was, you would be able to select and send that report to parents. And then you actually get read receipts as parents are looking at the report. And the, and the read receipts apply to both emails as well as logging into the system. So we can see that they are sent as well as sent and read. That's a very high level overview. There's so many more things in the reporting system, but hopefully that gets you started. I know there's some questions. I might pass it back off to Ross and drink some water. 
Thank you very much, Sandra. That was a really thorough overview. Um, I think the, the reports module is probably the, the single biggest, most important uh, element that's been added to Gibbon in the last few versions. For a long time, there was uh, only an external module that you could use, um, you know, which had its strengths, but this is really a, a massive leap forward in terms of customer, customize, customization and, uh, and, and sort of, um, yeah, just the whole experience from, from teachers right through to parents. So thank you to Sandra for, for introducing us to that. Um, we are gonna start the extend session in just a moment in which we'll be looking at additional modules. Um, Sandra will be resting her voice during that session. I'll be doing the talking here. Um, Brian, you have your hand up. Is that a fresh question? Uh, yes, it is. Um, you can tell me to take it offline, uh, but it is a query. Um, in the uh, report template building, um, I have a couple of times it, uh, had the situation where I can't edit the template, but I can add new templates. So when I was thinking about it, I, th I thought, well, I, I must have write permission to the uh, uh, directory. So I, I know, probably Sandra knows what that one is off the top, but I was, I was curious from a, a back end, uh, you know, what, what am I, what might have happened in that case? Yeah, that's a tricky one, and we might have to hop into the forums or some other medium to specifically look at that um, question. It is important to know that the templates themselves are, are files that exist on the server. So the template builder is actually connecting several different file templates that are on the server. If your server, for some reason, doesn't have access to read or write for those files specifically, that's sometimes where you'll run into problems. We are looking in version 22 to add an automated system to go through and read to check the permissions on those files. And that would show up under the system check page because the system check is there to kind of help you figure out does everything have the right permission. So we're looking at adding that to the system check so it can check through your report templates to let you know because sometimes if you're copying and pasting templates in creating them yourself, they can get the wrong permission on the system and that can happen in Gibbon as a whole too. So once um, Ross gets into the extent. Um, Examples, you'll see him adding a module to the system. And occasionally when you add modules or other files to your system, you'll need to check on those file permissions. That comes back kind of to that high level of managing your server. So I'll pass it back to Ross. Cool. Excellent, thank you, Sandra. Um, yes, uh, file permissions comes under um, sort of the general banner of system administration. Um, and it, it's a bit beyond the scope of, of being a Gibbon admin, but often being a Gibbon admin means being a system admin as well, depending on the size of, of your organization. Um, we have recently created a certification program. So it's a new element of Gibbon. And I'll be mentioning that at the end of the day in the meet the team section. But if you're interested in learning more about server admin and, and having the ability to be mentored in terms of file permissions and things like that, the certification is a good way to go. Of course, we're not going to stop using the forum to, to help people with that as well, but there's now just a few different routes opening up. Um, that wasn't a sales pitch, by the way, or maybe it was hard to say, but I'll cover the certification a little bit later on uh, for those who are interested. All right.